So what did you all want to be when you grew up? You know, most of us as kids, right, we get asked that question or we wonder that question. We ask that question to ourselves. What do I want to be when I grow up? Or someone says, what do you want to be when you grow up? As a kid growing up in Canada, that was a pretty easy answer. <laughs> Almost all of us wanted to be professional hockey players. It's what we thought about uh, before we got up and after we went to bed and all day. We played the sport in the summer, in the winter, in the fall, in the spring. Whether there was ice or not, we'd find some way to play hockey. That was my goal. Uh, and up to a certain point, I thought I had a pretty good shot at it. And then at some point, I realized, no way. I wasn't going to make it. Here's a, there was a survey done uh, last year. Uh, I think they asked like 2,000 uh, elementary kids what they would like to be when they grow up. Here's the top five answer. Number five, a teacher. Yay. Number four, the President of the United States. Number three, a doctor. Number two, a celebrity. Yeah, don't exact. So, yeah, celebrity. And then the number one answer was a superhero. A superhero. I'm thinking to myself, unless you come from another planet or got bit by a spider, that might be a stretch. Here are uh, a couple that I found uh, kind of uh, humorous. Uh, one student said, I'm seven now, so when I grow up, I want to be eight. <laughs> thinking that's, you know, realistic there. Next one, very ambitious, this one. I want a girlfriend, then I want to kiss her, and then I want to rule the world. <laughs> so I'm thinking that's kind of inclement, yeah, steps there. And finally, the last one, uh, I want to be a ninja chef. A ninja chef. I don't exactly know what a ninja chef is, but it sounds really cool. So uh, anyway, we're continuing our sermon series. I'm going to refer back to this. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series, Living in Joy, uh, and we've been uh, looking at chapters 3 and 4 from the letter to the church at Philippi that Paul writes, and we're nearing the end of that letter, and today we're looking at uh, verses 13 through 20 of chapter 4, and it's going to be up here on the wall, uh, or you can use the Bibles you brought with you, or the Bibles you find in the pews, or if you have a Bible app, you can use that as well. I can do all this through him who, strength, who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in... Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Ephroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. So uh, both Andy and I think we've uh, kind of stated a, a number of times that Paul loves this church and this church loves Paul. They have shared in his ministry and he is grateful and almost the entire letter is Paul encouraging them to continue to love Jesus and to follow Jesus and stay connected with Jesus as well as thanking them for how they have shared their resources with him. 
I'm going to take a little time at the beginning uh, today to explore verse 13. This verse is one of the most well-known and most quoted verses in the New Testament, uh, especially by church folk. But unfortunately, uh, it's a little misunderstood at times, and so I, I just want to spend a little bit of time with it. Uh, I'm going to project three translations or versions, versions of the verse. The first one's from the New International Version, the NIV. I can do all this. This is the one I read. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The next one is the New Living Translation. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And finally, the English Standard. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And all three of these versions or translations are well known, they are well respected. However, if you notice, the last two are slightly different than the first one. And that makes a difference in how we understand what Paul is trying to get at here and how he's trying to get us think, to think about this verse. There is a difference between all this, okay, and everything and all things. There is a qualitative and quantitative difference between those three. The first translation encourages us to understand this verse in context, and that is really important. The first and most obvious reason is that it doesn't make Paul out to be a liar, and second, it doesn't create a crisis of faith and disappointment in our lives. So let me try this. Uh, we're going to use the last one as an example, and we're going to say it out loud together, okay? On three. One, two, three. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. No, you can't. No, you can't. We can't do all things or anything, no matter how much Christ strengthens us. I can think of 20 things off the top of my head <laughs> that none of us will be able to do in our lifetime. No matter how much we trust Jesus for a variety of reasons. You know, LeBron James, anybody hear of LeBron James? This past Tuesday, he became the all-time leading point scorer in the NBA. None of us can do that. None of your children will be able to do that. And none of their children will probably be able to do that. It's not because they don't trust Jesus enough. There's a variety of reasons why. God gave LeBron James from his birth special talents and abilities along with being a really tall and amazing athlete person to do what he's been able to do, okay? Michaela Sheffrin, I don't know if any of you heard Michaela Sheffrin, she is about to break uh, the record for the most wins on the World Cup skiing tour. She is an amazing, amazing athlete. We could ski for like a hundred years and none of us are going to be able to ski like she can. For one thing, none of us want to put two planks on our feet and go 90 miles an hour down a hill. That's ice. But she can do that. So here's my point. Paul is not saying that you can do or be whatever you want simply because you have Jesus. Paul is not saying that if you are not that proficient at math, if you only trust in Jesus, you're going to ace the math portion on your SATs. What Paul is saying, and this is more important, and I think this is really applies and should, should give us comfort in our life, is that because of Jesus' strength in your life, when you don't do as well as you want to on that math portion of the SATs, you're going to be okay. <laughs> that Jesus is with you. That he is with us in our successes, 
But more importantly, he is with us in our failures, in our disappointments, because that's when we really need Christ's strength in our life, right? When challenges come in our way. That little phrase, all this, refers back to the previous verses where Paul has learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. This is what Paul has learned in his life, to be content in whatever the circumstances. Paul knew what it meant to live on both sides of the tracks, as it were. He knew what it meant to have plenty, and he knew what it meant to not have enough. He knew what it meant to have a house and not have a house. He knew what it meant to be free, and he knew what it meant to be chained in a prison cell. Paul had learned to be content no matter the circumstances. You know, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. It's happened a couple times to me, just like two or three times, I think. Uh, But if you fly quite a bit and you get points, or uh, if you talk really nice to the people at the um, uh, check, you know, where you buy your tickets for an airline ticket, uh, if they have room, sometimes they can, they, you can get bumped up to business class, right? And when you get into business class, if you've ever been there, OMG, right? It is so nice. And all of a sudden, you become friends with all these strangers, right? You're like, oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm just over here. Where can I get an orange juice like that? Right, and they hand you out these hot towels that you put on your face. You can have more than one, and it's amazing. Until the next flight that you have to be in economy. <laughs> then you're like, um, wh- why are there so many people here? Why is everyone so close to me? Where's my orange juice and my hot towel? Pretzels? That's all I get is pretzels? (laughs) It's easy to be content, right, in business class. (laughs) Tougher to be content once you get back in economy. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul wants the church in Philippi and us to know that living in joy means learning how to live in contentment. Contentment is when we submit our will, heart, and desires to the will of God, no matter the surrounding circumstances or conditions. When we submit our will, heart, and desires to the will of God, no matter what our circumstances. People that are content are neither overwhelmed by poverty nor intoxicated by prosperity. Because of him who strengthens me, I can be calm, thankful, and content in adversity, and humble in success. Notice then how Paul's teaching on contentment carries over to the next set of verses in our passage. We can do all this through Christ who strengthens us, but we are not meant, nor should we do this, all on our own. Christ's strength does come from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. But it also comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the body of Christ, the church. I'm not sure how many of you uh, pay attention to the financial markets uh, or the latest economic news. Uh, Certainly, right, with the increase of social media and cable channels, we have more access to ever-changing world Uh, world of stocks, investments, and global markets. And there there is nothing wrong uh, with having an IRA and or paying attention to our savings or checking accounts or investments. However, Wall Street should not be the most important street in a Christian's life. And I really liked what one person wrote about this passage that we're going to look at, uh, the rest of the passage. Our focus as Christians should not primarily be on our IRA, individual retirement account, but rather on our IEA, individual eternal account. 
Christians and local Christian churches, we should have an investment portfolio that has an eternal dimension, not simply a present or temporal dimension. And so with the time uh, we have left, uh, I'd like us to explore this a bit. Hopefully it'll cause us to think and consider what Paul is trying to tell us. First point, Paul knows the value of partnership when it comes to individual eternal accounts. The value of partnership. And he says it quite a few times in our verses. First one, it was good of you to share in my troubles. Verse 14. Next, verse 15. You sent me aid on my journey to Macedonia and then in Thessalonica. Verse 16. You sent me aid when I was in need several times. And then finally, verse 17, I don't desire your gifts, rather desire gifts be credited to your account. Do you see that partnership that goes on between Paul and this church in Philippi? You know, one of the most important aspects of a healthy partnership is that both sides share the struggles and the losses, but they also share the successes and the profits. And obviously, the same can be said in terms of human relationships, marriages, friendships, families, creative partnerships. There is a partnership between Paul and this church in Philippi where both sacrifice and enjoy the benefits which are shared on both sides. And so these sacrifices and benefits are experienced in the present, Absolutely. But they're also shared in the future and in the eternal. Paul receives present aid from a church that sacrifices by giving a portion of their present resources. But then Paul gives back to this church by publicly recognizing their sacrifice, which other churches would have taken notice and prays that God will credit even more to their account. That's the future. The future, or that that is also the present. The future is that we, now some 2,000 years later, are reading these words from Paul, which calls us to give to others who sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And we get to watch, then, how God multiplies that present aid for his kingdom growth. Think about this. Can you imagine there is even one person in the church in Philippi who stands up one day in a church meeting and says, Look, gang, if we give aid to the Apostle Paul now, Future generations of churches will be reading about our church's generosity. (laughs) There is no way that happened. No way. That would never have crossed their mind. In the same way, when we here at Northminster share resources and aid with others, give to our mission partners, support a meal packaging ministry as part of a 30-hour famine event, We have no clue how God is going to multiply those given resources for his kingdom and what our church will be known for in the future. It's not why we give, but that's the way God works. That's God's economy. But it doesn't stop with the present or even the future. How many Persons' eternal destinies have been radically altered because of this man chained to a prison cell. As we support Bible translations in Nigeria, provide aid for Muslim children to go to schools with Christian teachers in Ethiopia, or medical care in Panama, lives are changed for eternity. Eternity. Second point. Paul advises us on the kinds of investments that please God. The kinds of investments that please God. Verse 18, they, the gifts and sacrifice you have given, are a fragrant offering, 
an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. A fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. Christians and churches who practice sacrificial giving bring pleasure to God. And it's like a fragrance, a fragrant aroma. And that gives God pleasure. But watch this again. As we practice pleasing God, we as his people will have our needs met as well. Now, this isn't some kind of Ponzi, right, or pyramid scheme uh, where the more you give, God will somehow multiply, multiply, multiply and give you even more. Uh, th that is that, that hideous heresy of the prosperity gospel. That is not what Paul is talking about here. Paul's promise to these believers is rather that as they give to God, as we give to God, he will meet our material needs. He'll meet our needs, but he'll meet every other kind of need that we have. Third point, Paul instructs us to have an eternal perspective when it comes to our investments. An eternal perspective. You know, one of the hallmarks or consistent themes that is woven into Paul's theology is viewing what happens here on earth, especially how the church lives and acts from an eternal perspective. Paul was constantly thinking about how what the church does, how it behaves, how it believes, how that has eternal consequences and results. Paul encourages every believer and every church to consider their eternal investment portfolio. And this can be difficult for us. It, it's a difficult perspective for us to get our, our minds around, right? Because we can see or hear or experience what it means to give and see the fruits or the results of our giving in the present, right? We know what it means when we give our offerings each Sunday, and we know that it, it pays to have lights on in the sanctuary right now, or lights on through the rest of the building, for paying for church staff, for ministries that take place. We can even view and celebrate how our giving affects the future when we hear a report from a missionary that comes and visits us and says, two years ago you gave this is this is the results. These are the consequences. But how does one measure the investment we as believers and or a church has made in that person who listened to one of our services on the radio whom none of us have never met or never will meet? And God used that to affect their lives in a positive way. How do we measure the impact of our investment in children or youth ministries or those who attended an event like the 30-hour famine or the Thrive event we had last week? And one day, without us being aware, that person comes to faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and or decides to be a champion for biblical justice and the gospel and literally saves thousands of lives. Paul constantly had eternity in mind because Paul knows it is, the, it is eternity that really matters. It is eternity that really matters. Because eternity is a really long time. <laughs> Isn't it? It's a long time. The church at Philippi is purchasing stock in Paul. And that investment, whether they realize it or not, will earn huge interest for eternity. The same with the church today. The same with North Minster. How we as Christians and as a church live out the gospel today, which includes the sharing of our resources with others, will have eternal consequences, most of which we will never be aware of until Jesus comes again. I believe God now and again then prompts us to ask, how is our IEA account? Do we even have one? What's in it? And when is the last time we made a contribution? 
And do we understand that the investments we make now, because of the riches of God's glory in Christ Jesus, will produce eternal dividends? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We ask that we will learn, as Paul learned, to be content. Content in adversity, content in our challenging times, as we are content in our successes. Lord, that we will know that we have uh, an individual eternal account and that you have given us the resources to make a difference, not just for the present or the future, but for eternity. Lord, we do this all because you strengthen us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.